Not all of the Bible is an epically gripping read. The question is, how are we going to deal with that? Now, most of us would balk at the idea of taking a pair of scissors and cutting up our Bibles to produce some kind of tabloid version. I'm not suggesting that we do. But effectively, we do find ways to edit the Bible. Most of us do it by reading speed. You know what I mean. You know, there is the church reading speed, which goes something like this. Then there's the personal reading speed, which is something like how you would normally talk. Perhaps a little bit faster. And then there is the genealogy reading speed, where you get to genealogy and, and then you get back the narrative again and you're back to normal reading speed. Well, effectively, isn't that cutting up the Bible? Haven't we just produced a tabloid version? And if we have, what have we done to the message? Well, for instance, if you take Genesis chapter 4 and you start cutting it up when it comes to the genealogies, you just remove them. Effectively, that's what we do if we speed read through those parts. Effectively, what you do then is you go straight from Cain killing Abel to the flood. That's a problem. You change the message. Because in fact, there are thousands of years between the two events. And if you've got a version of the Bible in your head which just goes straight from one to the other, well, if you then go and read Psalm 103, it looks like a different God. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Mm. But that's not the version of God that you get if you've edited the Bible. It looks like he's rather hasty to get angry. Okay, so maybe you could put a bit of narrative in, you know, just, just a short sentence. You know, if you're a tabloid editor, you'd probably be suggesting that, wouldn't you? Put a little sentence in just to say, look, many centuries, many, many centuries, millennia passed, and then there was the flood. No, you, you still change the message. Because if you look in detail at Genesis chapter 5, for instance, you get written account of Adam's line, and verse 1 and 2, when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them, and when they were created, he called them man. And immediately, even someone like me is thinking, oh, hang on, I've read something like that before. That was in Genesis chapter 1, wasn't it? Hang on, I'll just go back and have a look. And we're meant to think that. That's exactly the point. We're meant to think, oh yeah, look, let us make man in our image. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. And in Genesis chapter 5, you're seeing this fruitfulness, this increase in number. And then verses 3 and 4, that echo that you caught originally in the first two verses is re-echoed in Adam. God creates, Adam procreates. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. There's a message here, and the message is about God's faithfulness to his promises. It doesn't matter whether people are being faithful or not, God is faithful to his promises. We miss that message if we try and help the Bible by dealing with its repetitiveness. Faithfulness, by and large, is repetitive. If we insist that repetitive is boring and therefore we ignore it, we diddle ourselves because there is a message about faithfulness that spans generations, centuries. There's a message here and we miss it if we speed read through. You see and I see lists of names everywhere we go. Particularly, I mean, I think of Broad Green in Wellingborough where you go and you see the War Memorial. Now, no one sees a list 
of names on a, a war memorial and insists that's not very readable. Could you make it a bit more interesting? Could we have something with a bit more pizzazz in the middle of our town? No, the war memorial is there simply to arrest the eye, to stop you. And you do, I do anyway, I have to scan down lists of names on war memorials when I see them. Out of respect, really. And it's meant also to give us a sense of proportion, historically, about what goes on in our town, isn't it? Well, similarly, the genealogies, the name lists in the Bible, are meant to give a sense of historical proportion. They're meant to give us a sense of historical scale, which we completely miss if we speed read through them. I've got a, a, a map of Wellingborough over there on, on, on the wall in my study. And some bits are quite interesting, you know, you look at it and you think, oh, that's interesting, that goes around there. Yeah. The grid lines are not interesting. But they are very, very helpful when I want to find your house, assuming that you live in Wellingborough. So we have these genealogies in the Bible and they give us a sense of depth and scale about what is going to happen. There is action, there is gripping stuff in the Bible, but it's not all equally gripping. However, I do recommend that we read it attentively whether it's gripping or not. Then we get that sense of, sh of scale, then we share that. If we don't, we might have one of two problems. One, we might believe in a God who is rapidly angered, quickly angered. Now, if you believe in a God who is quickly angered, you've got certain problems. You're not going to want to go and confess your sin. You're not going to want to come to him for forgiveness because you believe he's quickly angered. He's just going to snap and that's the end of you. You might believe, if you have our edited version of the Bible, in a God who just goes absent for long periods of time. Well, that's going to be a problem for us because then we're not going to want to pray, are we? What's the point? God just might be absent for a while. In my version of the Bible, he goes absent between Cain and Noah because I've cut that bit out in my mind in the way that I read the Bible. I've effectively, I've edited it. So I'm going to suggest that we don't edit the Bible. We find a way of reading the genealogies attentively, not pretending that they're a really ripping good yarn. They're not, and they're not meant to be. But can I just suggest one more reason for spending a bit of time on the less interesting bits of the Bible? And that reason is you and me. Let's face it, historically, we're boring. We're insignificant. Nobody is going to write my biography. Are they going to write yours? No one is going to tell of the heroic deeds of Duncan Wright, giant slayer. Well, they're not. I'm boring. But there are so many bits of the Bible where people like me feature where boring, insignificant people, as far as the world is concerned, turn out to be written on the palms of God's hands. Where people who only turn up in the crowd at football matches have their names written down by God. Not as a spectator, but as a participant. There are boring bits in the Bible, oh for sure. Let's not deny it. Those are the bits where you and I come in 